This video is brought to you by Structural Central. Visit StructuralCentral.com to quickly generate structural engineering calculations like those discussed here. Hello engineers! Today I'm going to show you how to determine some of the snow loads on your roof, including loads due to snowdrift. If you're designing a structure, you're going to need to make sure the roof can support the maximum snow load that is expected during the entire life of the structure. If the structure happens to be in a warmer climate where there's little ground snow load, you may be tempted to just say, hey, I already have to design the structure for a roof live load of 20 pounds per square foot. Since our ground snow is less than that, I can just ignore it. While this is wrong for several reasons, the most significant is that even in a region with just 5 PSF ground snow load, the 3 inches of balanced snow that is expected can turn into over 2 feet of snow in areas due to drifting. Then you may end up with loads exceeding 30 PSF, which is significantly more than the roof live load. So unless you happen to be in one of these regions where the ground snow load is zero, you are not off the hook. Now let's get into it. A version of the International Building Code, or IBC, applies for nearly all structures within the United States. The IBC then references Chapter 7 of ASC 7 for determining the snow loads. The first thing you need to determine is the flat roof snow load. This is done using the formula shown. The formula works by taking the 50 year ground snow load and adjust it to apply for roofs by multiplying it by these factors, which account for how much snow is blown off the roof, how much snow melts due to heat coming from inside the building, and how devastating a collapse of the structure would be. We'll go through the factors in the equation one by one. The first factor is 0.7. This is basically your starting point. It says that the snow load on the roof will be 70% of the ground snow load for heated, partially exposed building in an urban, suburban, or wooded area of ordinary importance. From here, the other factors make adjustments for any deviation from that condition. The second factor is CE, or the exposure factor, which accounts for the wind blowing snow off of the roof. Its value can be found in a table in ASC 7, and it depends on two conditions, the surface roughness category and the exposure of roof. First, we'll look at surface roughness category. This parameter accounts for obstructions in the upwind direction within about a mile of the building. A region with lots of large obstructions from buildings or trees will be less windy than a region that is flat and open. Category B is for urban, suburban, or wooded areas. Category C is for flat, open country where the obstructions are generally less than 30 feet tall. And category D is for completely unobstructed areas, like you would get from water surfaces or mud flats. Additionally, there are other options for when the building is above the tree line or in Alaska with no trees within two miles of the structure. For exposure of roof, it is accounting for obstructions within the immediate vicinity of the structure. More specifically, it is looking at a 10 to 1 plane that starts at the roof level. If nothing passes through this plane, then the roof is fully exposed. If there are any trees or taller buildings that break through the plane, they are considered obstructions and so the roof is partially exposed. Large mechanical equipment and parapets also count as obstructions. To be sheltered, the building must have conifers tightly around the building. Deciduous trees do not count since they are leafless in the winter. Moving on, we have CT, which is the thermal factor, which accounts for snow melting. The options are pretty straightforward. The colder the roof is, the less the snow will melt. CT is 1.0 for a normal heated building. It goes up to 1.1 if the temperature is kept just above freezing or if you have a ventilated roof with good insulation. 1.2 is for unheated or open air structures. And then the maximum CT value of 1.3 is for freezer buildings. It's also possible to use a CT value of 0.85 for a heated greenhouse, but this is only permitted if there is a warning system in case of a heating failure. The next factor is for IS, or the importance factor. Its value can be found in Chapter 1 of ASC 7, and it depends on the structure's risk category. The importance factor is used to adjust the 50-year ground snow load so that it applies for different periods. A risk category of 1 is for minor storage facilities, which are designed for a 25-year ground snow load, and it goes up to 4 for essential facilities, which are designed for a 100-year ground snow load. Finally, you have PG, which is the ground snow load with a 50-year mean recurrence interval. Its value depends on where the structure is located within the United States. For most locations, it can be found using the map in ASE 7, 
but be sure to check with the authority having jurisdiction to make sure that you are using the value that they require. Now that you have all the factors, you can plug them into the equation to determine the flat roof snow load. Next, you'll need to determine the sloped roof snow load, which is also called the balanced snow load. This is done by multiplying the flat roof snow load, PF, by the CS factor, which is the slope factor. The slope factor obviously takes into account the slope of the roof, but it also considers how warm and how slippery the roof is. Its value is determined using one of three graphs found in ASC 7. You select the graph based on the value you previously used for CT. The value will then come from either the dashed line or solid line depending on if the roof is considered an unobstructed slippery surface. To be considered an unobstructed slippery surface, there can't be any obstructions that would prevent the snow from sliding. The surface must also be a smooth material like metal, slate, glass, or be a bituminous rubber or plastic membrane. Once you know which line applies, you can get the CS value from the graph by using the roof slope. You can now multiply it by PF and then you've determined the sloped roof snow load. In addition to the sloped roof snow load, you're also going to need to determine the minimum snow load. If there's a single heavy snowstorm with little to no wind, the snow in the roof will be the same depth as the snow on the ground. The minimum snow load covers this case. The formula is just the importance factor, IS, times the minimum of the ground snow load, PG, and 20 PSF. It is similar to the flat roof snow load, but does not include the factors for the roof's exposure and any thermal effects. The limitation of 20 PSF for PG is required since a single storm is unlikely to exceed this amount. This is a separate uniform load case that does not need to be combined with drift. Now we're ready to start talking about the drift snow load. The majority of snow related failures are due to snow drifts, and as mentioned earlier, you can end up with peak loads that are over 10 times as much as the balanced snow load. They occur when the geometry of the roof or rooftop equipment prevents the wind from blowing snow out of that area, which is known as a wind shadow. This leads to upwind snow getting blown into and then accumulating in this region. The height of the snowdrift, HD, can be determined using the graph found in ASC 7, or it can be calculated directly using the formula shown. The drift height increases as the upwind length, LU, increases. For drifts that occur due to changes in the roof elevation, the snow may be accumulating from snow being blown off of the higher roof when the wind blows in the leeward direction, or the snow may be coming from the lower roof when the wind blows in the windward direction. So for this condition, you need to determine HD in both directions and then design the structure for the larger value. When determining HD, you need to account for the following adjustments and limits. If the wind is in the windward direction, you need to include a 0.75 factor since windward drifts trap less snow than leeward drifts. For wind in the leeward direction, the drift height is limited to 60% of the lower roof length. If the upwind length is less than 20 feet, the formula will produce unrealistic values, so instead you determine the drift height using an LU value of 20 feet. This height is then limited by the formula shown, which is based on the assumption that 50% of the snow on the roof gets trapped. Now that you know how to determine the height of the snow drift, let's see how it gets applied for an actual roof. The balanced snow load occurs everywhere on the roof. Its height is HB, and it is determined by dividing this balanced snow load PS by the density of snow gamma. The density of snow can be calculated using the formula shown. The next important dimension is HD. This is the snow drift height that we previously determined using the chart of the formula. It is the height of the triangular portion of the snowdrift. You can multiply it by the density of snow to determine the drift surcharge load, PD. The final vertical dimension is HC. It is the clear height from the top of the balanced snow to the top of the element that is creating the wind shadow. When the snowdrift height is less than the height of the element causing the wind shadow, the width of the drift will be 4 times HD, which is for snow at a 1 in 4 slope. Now we're going to take a look at how the snowdrift dimensions change as the value for the snowdrift height increases. When the upwind length, LU, increases, HD increases, so the snowdrift width also increases, still maintaining the 1 in 4 slope. Once the snowdrift reaches the top of the element causing the wind shadow, it does not continue to get any higher since the snow would just get blown away. Instead, it begins to grow wider and wider until it reaches 8 times HC, 
which is for a 1 in 8 slope. At this point, the transition is so gradual that no additional snow accumulates. If the calculated drift width is wider than the roof, then you can reduce the drift height to zero at the edge of the roof, so that the load is just from the balanced snow load. And that's how you determine the snow loads on your roof due to drifting. Keep in mind that this has just been a quick overview of the process. You'll need to look closely at ASC 7 to make sure you are meeting all of its requirements. If you would like to easily create snow load calculations like those discussed here, visit StructuralCentral.com. There you will be able to quickly generate structural engineering calculations just by entering a few inputs. With its intuitive interface and live updating, you will be able to start getting results immediately. Descriptions are displayed next to the input options, so you won't need to flip through pages to find them. Input dimensions directly on the drawings and see how it affects the snowdrift. Calculations are well referenced with values plugged in, just like you would write by hand. You can also move the mouse over the variables to see a description of what they are and see all other instances where they are used, making calculation review a breeze. Head on over to StructuralCentral.com and sign up for free today.